and then we have uh, peace and quiet. So we're going to start a few minutes early. Um, this is this is a great turnout. Um, one of the panelists said this is a popular topic. I'm not sure that's exactly the right word. I told someone else I was still, I was moderating a session on executive compensation, and they said, "Okay, are you for or against?" And I think that 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 got it. Uh, the uh, emotion, anyway, uh, surrounding some of these issues. Uh, my name is Adi Ignatius. I'm the um, editor in chief of the Harvard Business Review, and I'll be moderating the session today. Um, I'm going to inter introduce the panelists in a second, but I want to just uh, tee up the topics uh, before that, make sure you're in the right room. Um, so the, the topic at hand is rethinking um, compensation models, in particular uh, in the wake of the Great Recession. Um, we're hoping to um, talk about two aspects of this issue, one being the, the fairly technical one. Um, you know, what are, what are compensation models that work? Uh, what is the best way to link, in particular, CEO pay to performance, short-term, long-term, um, what have you? Are there, are there broader measures than financial that, that, that can be um, profitably uh, included in that, <coughs> in that measurement? But then, we also want to tee up and discuss um, a, a sort of broader, bigger issue, more of a societal issue. And that's really, um, you know, in a world where uh, d despite organizations like this, despite discussions like this, despite progress that has been made in many areas, you know, we're still in a situation where 90% um, of the population controls only 10% of the world's resources. So, uh, you know, to what extent um, uh, does vastly unequal pay, um, you know, to what extent is that, is that unacceptable? Um, if we want to tackle um, the bigger societal problems. Peter Drucker, the, um, the uh, eminent uh, management guru who had a lot of smart things to say about a lot of things, uh, you know, his advice often quoted was that the top executive compensation at a company should not exceed, uh, should not be more than 20 times that of the lowest paid worker. Um, he was alarmed 20 years ago when um, that gap had ballooned on average to about 40 to 1. Um, in recent years, depending how you measure it, it might be 300 to 1, it might be 400 to 1. So there are a couple of issues there. Does that kind of gap affect motivation of workers uh, in a negative way? And there are questions of whether uh, pay could conceivably be measured to performance. Or, as some people say, is it just not pay for performance, but pay for pulse. If you're in the seat, uh, your options vest or your bonus accrues, and uh, that's really the only thing that's measured. And that, um, I think, gives critics fuel to say that we're, we're, we're in a culture of entitlement. In 2008, CEOs averaged $11 million in pay. Um, to many, that those figures say there's a problem there. So. Um, so let me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to introduce the panelists, but then I'd, I'd love it if um, we could get one or two comments from the audience, just brief bullet points of issues that, that you would like to throw out before we get the discussion going. So, so I'll, I'll look for uh, a couple of comments. It's a slight departure from at least what I've done in the past, moderating. So, so if you have one or two comments. But, and, and this is the order that we're going to be speaking. So Philip, uh, Philip Jennings uh, will kick off from... Uh, UNI Global Union in Switzerland, then Shumit Banerjee, the CEO of Booz & Company in the UK, Mark Mactus, who is the chairman and CEO of Towers Perrin in the US, Peter Weinberg, founding partner of Pirella Weinberg Partners, uh, also from the US, and then Stephen Pagliuca, who is the managing director of Bain Capital um, in the US. So before we, we turn to our panelists, who will give brief remarks before we get the discussion going, um, would anyone like to, to just you know, make, a, make a quick comment these are the issues that we teed up. Um, just a point you want to make before we launch into the broader discussion. There's one. Yes. Is there any specific reason why the, uh, the panelists are all chosen from US? Uh, well, there's, there's, there's one from Switzerland and one from the UK. Um, I, didn't, 
I didn't select the panel. I'm from the U.S. I have a funny name. You know, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I hopefully we'll get a, 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 a diverging. Yeah, there are two from Europe, and we'll get a, a range of opinions. My grandfather was a shoemaker from Italy. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a hand over here. Sure. I'm Jack Enos. I'm the CEO of Callister's Pension Fund and uh, you know, a large institutional investor from California. Just to, just I think that the issue I think for all of us is still is getting the alignment right with long-term investors, patient capital, uh, with the incentive structures and plans. And, and we've just been, I think, so frustrated that now we're driven to these sort of uh, voting issues now on say on pay and other ways of sending the message to boardrooms. Uh, when we just don't see that uh, responsiveness coming from the boardroom around alignment with shareholders. And so um, it's hard to figure out how do you actually bridge that finally. I mean, we all, unfortunately, I think we all know the politically right thing to say right now around executive compensation, but we just can't get it right. Um, and, and of course, the, the public certainly, I think, shares the view of long-term shareholders pretty clearly. Okay, let's take, let's take one more here, and then we'll um, go to the panelists in the second row here. Thank you. I just wondered how much the panel thought that executive pay or senior executive pay has become a license to operate issue these days. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. So let's. Um, we're going to, like I say, we're going to have all the panelists speak. Then we'll get a discussion going among ourselves, and then I, I, I would love to have the audience jump in and, and ask some questions and make some points as well. So let, let me start with uh, Philip Jennings. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm back from Wales. Uh, I'm replacing Wales. UK, Wales. Uh, I, um, I was replacing Dick Trumka today, the president <coughs> of AFL-CIO. I represent that what was the thin red line, which has been flatlining for the last four decades or so. I have a similarity with Dick. He was a miner. I'm from a mining community, a mining country. And there was a great industrialist that was one of those entrepreneurs that opened the mines and the ironworks and the steelworks. And when he died, on his 10-ton slab, because he was worried about his body being desecrated, he left the words, God forgive me. That was the conscience he took to his death because he felt he'd made his riches out of exploitation. Now, working people are angry. We're rightly angry. We're seeing bonuses for failure. We are financing the bailout. It is steel workers' money, mine workers' money, shop workers' money, bank workers' money, and others that's going into the bailout. We are angry. What we're seeing is obscene, and we can draw some conclusions. The trickle-down theory has not worked. Flexible labor markets have not worked. An uncontrolled CEO pay has shown that when you're given the responsibility, CEOs are acting with great irresponsibility. Something has to happen. 90% of us are not in this group, and there's even that, that top group is 0.1% of the upper earning quartile, whatever they call it. That means 99.9% .9 of us should be angry about this. What to do? The trade union movement will lift a finger about this. We will take this to the G20, and we suggest the next G20 summit be held in the name and the memory of Peter Drucker, where we call this the 20 to 1 summit. And we want to take this issue on distributional justice to the G20 summit. The employment ministers are meeting in April in Washington, DC. Distributional justice and inequality in our societies is on the agenda. The share of wages and the wealth produced is as low now as it's been since records were kept. This is not sustainable. This is not fair. This is breaking down trust in society. So what do we do about this? G20 summit, we flag it up. We will take this issue as a trade union movement there. We will, we will couple this with national campaigns in national governments throughout the world. Secondly, distributional justice. We need active labor market policies. You will not bridge inequality without active labor market policies. You talk about a say on pay for CEOs in the corporate governance network. We want to say on pay on our own wages. In the United States of America, only 6% of workers in the private services sector have a say on their pay. Collective bargaining has collapsed. And we're seeing similar trends in other countries. Social safety nets work. Without the social safety nets in place, inequality would be worth. Tax, tax policies work. 
public sector investment policies work. Number three, to us, the fixing of CEO pay just looks like a racket. I'm sorry about this. This benchmarking with other CEOs. We'd like you to compare it with the lowest guy in the shop. And we'd like a remuneration committee to explain to the shareholders why the top guy is earning 350 times more than the person on the shop floor. Put some workers in this remuneration committee. Put some women in the remuneration committee. Uh, there's no women on this panel. I'm glad to see the Norwegians now make it compulsory to have women on the board. More transparency about how these pay is established. And surely the amount in bonuses that is paid in the report package is just out of proportion to the work that's being done. It has to be brought back into some kind of common sense. We'd like shareholders to stand up. I'd like our pension trustees to stand up. This cannot go on. It's not sustainable. Something has to happen. Finally, I would like to have a reflection about the purpose of business. We've seen this market fundamentalist approach, profit maximization above all, shareholder value above all. Can't we recalibrate the function of the business? That it has a broader purpose, that both, both the, the outcomes and the processes have some degree of fairness involved. In conclusion, I talked about God forgive me. Can I say to Mr. Lloyd Blankfein that God, I think he considered himself as God's banker, all the Financial Times considered him as God's banker, that Lloyd, you will be forgiven if you put a break on this pay structures, if you put a break on these bonuses and bring your reward systems back into the reality that the average working man and women can make some sense and see some credit in because it's not there today. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now, Shumit Banerjee, the CEO of Booz & Company in the UK. <laughs> I wanted to sort of make, um, I did three points uh, on this conversation. The first is that um, in a lot of this sort of debate, um, there, are, there, are, there are very important questions of distributional justice that Phillips talked about. But we actually sit down in a remuneration committee and try and figure out how to set pay that is based on things other than value. I'm holding aside the question of how much you get paid for value. I think that it's very, very difficult and I probably not advisable to, to saddle companies with social missions. I think that generally doesn't work terribly well. I think we have other instruments such as taxation and the redirection of uh, taxation, things like education, that serve quite well to do some of these sorts of things. Uh, the second thing I would say is that at the heart of many of these conversations is the question of how much is too much. Uh, and personally, of course, I have my own views about how much is too much. Where I get in trouble is I don't know how to actually direct that to telling others how much is too much. I just find that quite a difficult job to do. I'm not suggesting that it shouldn't be done, but I think it is very difficult to apply distributional justice in the context of a company or for the board of a company. Uh, what I'm saying really is that you know, there was a system uh, out there that where there were a set of people at the top of the system who believed they knew the answers to these sorts of questions. Um, but that system collapsed around 1990, um, you know, the, the, the one that was a bit further east of here. Um, finally, I will say that, uh, you know, when I think about the question of executive compensation, um, I think that there is a public interest around uh, executive compensation. And I think that is where if one believes that compensation structures, not level, but compensation structures exacerbate problems of moral hazard, for example, and those problems pose a risk to society, then I think it is entirely appropriate for us to examine, for regulators, for example, to ask questions about compensation structure. So in particular, I've done quite a lot of writing recently about how traders are paid, and I think any examination of that structure in a large bank will tell you that there are significant problems with incentive compatibility uh, between the short and the long, and, uh, and that we ought to be asking some tough questions about the relationship between risk-taking, capital, and executive compensation in those situations. But I would, I would attempt to limit that debate in my own mind to circumstances where there is a genuine public interest. In other words, if, if excessive risk-taking or the wrong kind of risk-taking poses risks to society because of the sorts of systemic collapse that are uh, possibly inherent in that sort of victory. So I'll leave it at that for now, Adi, and just, just um, uh, let's hear from the rest of us. Yeah. OK, great. Uh, next up is Mark Mactus of Towers Parrot. Um, I, I'd like to make uh, comments on several levels here because I think uh, the issue is, uh, probably to state the obvious, quite complex. 
I think at one level, you can look within the kind of the environment of the corporation and, and CEO pay and board responsibility and compensation committee responsibility. And, and we have learned lessons in the recent past. We don't, nobody wants pay for failure and we need to align the incentives with the right kind of objectives for executives to drive what the corporation's objectives should be. I want to take it in a, in a different direction here. I think there are numerous dimensions to this issue. And, and the first at the most macro level is the value that society places on various things. So for example, um, we might think teachers aren't paid enough, but are we willing to pay more taxes to fund their pay? We may think celebrities earn too much, yet we still go to ball games and watch things on TV. So I, I think there's a fundamental issue to address that's at, a, at the most macro level that is part of this equation that is worth talking about. The next level as you come down the funnel is what I'll call the governance environment for corporations. And in most, I'll speak uh, primarily from a US perspective here for a second. In most states in the United States, uh, the responsibility of boards is to serve shareholder interests and that implies shareholder value. Um, in Pennsylvania, they have a little bit of a different corporate governance environment where you're allowed to take into account in making decisions all stakeholders. Okay, without putting a priority on which are the most or least important stakeholders in making decisions as a board for what's in the best interest of the company. Uh, put another way, if boards and, and executives make decisions that don't ally, align with the governance environment, they run the risk of running afoul of those and being held accountable. So I think the governance environment is a very important dimension of this because after all, boards and CEOs have to operate within it. The next dimension is the shareholder. And shareholders uh, essentially are looking for a return on their investment that's reasonable. And that's uh, a function of how a corporation performs and the earnings stream that they can expect from the corporation. And uh, until and unless and when investors start asking for something else, I think it's going to be hard for a corporation to have a broader perspective, certainly if the governance environment doesn't allow it to do things. So I think the issue is quite complex. I think uh, boards are taking the matters, at least in the work that we do, very seriously. And there's a lot of good dialogue, good deep thought going on around how to get this thing right, have a more balanced scorecard for engaging CEO performance, and what the elements of a CEO's compensation structure should be to align with those to further uh, shareholder interests. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, next up is Peter Weinberg of Parallel Weinberg Partners. Thanks, Addy, and good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, I, I, it sounds like what we're really doing here, uh, Addy, is to sort of set up the guideposts for the discussion, uh, because the, the, the is this issue is so massive that it's hard to have sort of a generic discussion at a very high altitude. And so I'll, I'll offer uh, just uh, three thoughts of my own on what I think some of the central issues are of debate. Um, one of, one, the first one I would say is just purely the amount of money that people are getting paid, just irrespective of do they deserve it, do they not, just the, the, the absolute magnitude. Now, that, that's a very important issue because it interferes, I think, with the debate if, if people don't agree on it. And, and so, you know, there's some people who think, you know, there were, there were financial institutions who cut their compensation to a million dollars, just to use an example. And some people say in that institution, gee, that's a tremendous sacrifice. And there are other people on, uh, on Main Street, certainly in the United States and elsewhere around the world, who are saying that is preposterous. And so there, the, the issue of the magnitude of the compensation alone, I think, is an, is an, important, is an important point. Another issue I think is important is um, that has to do with Wall Street compensation, which Wall Street compensation structure provoked systemic instability. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and so the question is that, that that's an easier issue to deal with because you can sort of analytically go through with people uh, who are expert in, in compensation and try to figure out a structure that aligns those people with the system. <coughs> And I feel quite strongly that there are two major things that can be done. And, and this is not an easy thing to execute within a financial institution, but it's, it's doable. Uh, and I think the two things that need to be done are, one is, is that people need to be paid more over time, and there has to be some look-back mechanism 
that the board or some other entity within a company can look at to decide whether or not you did, in fact, create value, whatever that means, over some period of time. It's not a year. It's more like five years. And the other part of it is to have uh, be invested in the firm so you care about the firm. So be skin in the game is often uh, used as, as a term to, uh, to describe that. And that's another thing that can be done. But, that's, but the Wall Street comp issue is, 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 is a different one, and it's, it's, it's related to some of the societal issues we're talking about, but it's, but it's more refined in the sense that I'm discussing it. The third point uh, that I wanted to raise okay. was the fact that our compensation systems generally in the West are not designed to reward focus on the broader shareholder. They're not. They're, so a, a chief executive will not be rewarded for making a societal investment. Uh, a chief executive won't really be rewarded uh, for, for having a green company, uh, at least in the, in the marketplace today. To some extent, are they? Yes. Are there some socially uh, responsible funds that only gravitate to, to those institutions? Yes. But generally, there isn't. And there are all sorts of things I won't get into now. We can talk about it if people feel like it. Uh, but there are all sorts of things that can be done uh, in that regard. But to me, that's kind of, when I think about the compensation issue, it's hard to talk about it as one umbrella issue. And at least in my own view, those are, th those are three aspects of it that I wanted to raise. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, and then last up is Stephen Pekluku, Managing Director of Bain Capital. Well, it's always great being last on these, these panels with uh, such brilliant people before you, but uh, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, I, I grew up, uh, my grandfather was a shoemaker, and I've been labor. My, my father-in-law team, was a teamster, um, and, and there is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. There is a huge problem in disparity of labor. Now, I wouldn't relate that to compensation systems. I'd, I'd relate it to the fact that we have a global economy, and labor has been cheapened as, as you, sp you spread out to the other economies and have cheap labor, and you don't have the same kinds of rules you have in industrialized countries, there's been a huge diminution, diminution of labor. Now, I also recently ran for office in the United States, so I, I, I spent a lot of time you know, with labor. Yeah. And, um, and uh, there is definitely a problem. But the whole problem is an elephant, and you know, we can only kind of bite off one piece of the elephant at once, and it's, it's a, we can't take it and make it simplistic. It's not as simple as 20 to 1. It's not as simple as you know, 300 to 1. Uh, because in my business, you know, I've been involved in several businesses where we go in, and we buy a business that's losing 20, 30 million dollars a year, has 1,000 people, would be about to be shut down, and we bring in a great CEO. And I've literally seen them drive that company to have a company of you know, you know, 20,000 people uh, working with good wages. And you bring in a bad CEO, so let's say you, you pay less and you can't get a, a, and a bad CEO, drives the company right out of business. Uh, so to me, and why I like private equity is, it is all about you know, alignment and focusing on shareholder and stakeholder value, and it's through the whole chain. It's good societally. It's, it's good for the company as well. But if we get too, out, too far afield and have sound bites and prescriptions, mm -hmm. then we're going to drive a lot of companies you know, right out of business. And uh, if, if, you take, if you take a CEO who has built the company, helped help build the company, I think business has realized that these CEOs are very, very important, especially in the complex you know, global world, what you have to do to drive and gain market share and beat the competition. So the wrong CEO can drive you right down, the right one can drive you up, therefore the prices have been bid up. The problem is we're paying mediocre CEOs and we're not paying them based on performance. Uh, the private equity model is so linked in. Uh, my, my personal investment in the company, our personal from Bain Capital, we're the largest investors in our own funds, which means we're the largest investors in the companies we invest into, plus our shareholders. And so we pay very close attention to this on the compensation committee. We try to link pay to performance. And it, it, it's not as simple as saying, well, the shareholders got killed because the stock stayed at you know, 140, and, and, um, and it was 145 years later, and the CEO made you know, $20 million. Well, you can look at that industry, and if you're, if, you're, if you're in that industry and the rest of the companies went down to 40 because you had a cyclical downturn, your CEO did a great job keeping it up at 140. You didn't lose your money mm -hmm. because that CEO protected you. So you can't solve this in sound bites. You can't solve it you know, by 20 to 1. Where you, where you have to solve it is at the board level, at the government level. The government, first of all, has to ensure that everybody has health care and has a basic you know, minimum wage. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the corporate level, you have to have a compensation committee that looks at the big picture, looks at performance, puts in long-term incentives. I'll give you a real perverse result of, of some governmental laws, uh, and I think we need more regulation. But, but right now, if a private equity company buys a company, turns it around, and let's say we own 100% of the company, and we take it public, and the public buys 25% you know, of the company or even 40% even of the company, the private equity people who sit on the board, who were the comp committee that helped drive the company up and bring the CEO in, 
the rules now are we can't be on the compensation committee because we own 60% of the company. And I think that's exactly the opposite of what should be because <laughs> I'm trying to protect my investment, your investment from, from Calsters, uh, and, and we're trying to, trying, to, trying to do that. And then we're not on the compensation committee. We're the toughest people on the CEOs because we're in there for the shareholders. In, ter in terms, of, in terms of, the, of, the, of the labor issue, you know, we've got to focus on some macro issues on how we protect our, protect our labor and make sure other countries are, are being environmental, they, they have minimum wages, they have, th they have things to kind of make the la labor equal balance because it's going to be a real hard problem you know, with this global world mm -hmm. if we put in prescriptive rules and then the companies can't function, then everything's going to come from China, everything's going to come from India, and we are going to be left with a, with a very you know, different, different society. So, so my, in conclusion, I'd say that alignment is key, uh, linking ownership with those decisions is key, not regressing towards the mean. I'll, I'll add another factoid. You look at the NBA. I'm one of the co-owners of the Boston Celtics. And uh, we paid Kevin Garnett, I believe, $22.5 million per year. And the lowest paid player in the NBA maybe makes $500,000 a year. So what is that? That's a, that's a, that's a pretty good size you know, you know, ratio. Um, every day, every team, every day, they'd be happy to pay Kevin Garnett you know, $22 million a year because we won an NBA championship and we would not do without Kevin Garnett. Yeah. Now the issue is, and the issue some teams have and some corporations have is, they say, well, this guy's not really Kevin Garnett. You know, he may be seven feet tall, but he, he plays okay, but let's pay him like Kevin Garnett because we dream that he could be Kevin Garnett. That's the problem <laughs> that we have. It's a regression towards the top. So we say the guy's the CEO, he's important. So, so no matter how good or bad he is, you know, we're gonna pay him like Kevin Garnett. So what boards need to do and compensation committees need to do is to say, if you have Kevin Garnett, yeah, you gotta pay him. And it makes no sense to put these caps on because if, if your company goes from a billion dollars in value to 10 billion in value, and that CEO really helped drive that, and labor actually, actually made more money, and by the way, I'd add in, we ought to incorporate labor into incentive plans and stock ownership. Yeah. That's another way for them to benefit you know, proportionally, and we try to do that mm -hmm. in our companies, and I think we have to see a trend. To me, it's all about alignment. So, so in the industrialized country, they've got to align labor with management, come up with a cooperative thing. They've all got to realize we can't be in sound bites and fighting because if labor is fighting for you know, work rules that debilitate the company, for uh, a time off that's different than, than, than double the, the amount, then there's going to be less people working. And so we've got to meet somewhere in the middle where, where labor gets incented by equity, where labor is being treated fairly, where we work at the government level and, that, and global level to try to get labor treated fairly throughout the world because it's a competitive situation. But then, then only can we build a society that's appropriate and, and, and get that ratio back. And, and I am concerned because the ratio has been, I've been studying it, the ratio pre-World War II was kind of 60 to 1. Right after World War II, yeah. it went down to 40 to 1. Yeah. And, then, and, and, and now really it is 300 something to 1. That doesn't seem right to me, but a lot of that problem is caused by the, 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 you know, the globalness of the economy and the fact that labor is cheaper in other places. And we've got to figure out a way to address that and bite little pieces of that elephant off. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, all the panelists. Um, let me, I, I want to sort of follow up on a couple things. I'll ask specific questions, but you know, anybody can, can then jump in. But Stephen, let, let me follow up with you for, with a sec for a second. Um, um, you know, y you said it doesn't make sense to sort of mandate uh, these ratios and things like that. But, you know, I was thinking about, and I guess, Peter, you had talked about um, the question of magnitude. You know, when, when AIG came out and said, all right, we're going to pay, uh, you know, 168 million in bonuses, uh, it was an outrage. It was unacceptable. And, uh, uh, you know, I think 73 people were getting more than a million. If you really looked at it, it was far more complex than just, you know, these jerks ripping us off. I mean, it, you know, it, it, was, it was a very complicated thing. So that, so that yes, there, there were magnitude questions. There's no absolute wrong and right. But there is a climate that we exist in, and there, there, there are demands from society, there are political concerns. It was simply unacceptable, even though you could argue, wait a minute, this was, you know, I had deferred compensation, and this is all. So where I'm, where I'm going with this is, you know, I'm thinking about when, when BP in the 90s sort of begged the government to, to put in emission controls for everybody, for everybody, because it's difficult to implement them yourself um, and, and, and remain at sort of competitive advantage. You know, are there not things, I don't know if a ratio between, you know, for, for, for getting competing CEOs, but just an acceptable amount, top CEO pay compared to 
lowest worker, average worker, something like that, a ratio that, that, you know, would that really be such a bad thing? You know, I do think it would be a bad thing because, you know, workers benefit when these companies grow. And, and look, I'd like to benefit by having stock ownership, you know, more, more proportional to, to contribution, and they could grow, you know, with it. So when you start doing those kinds of mandates, you can drive a whole company down. You've got, and so to me, it's a principles-based thing. You have to have a compensation committee that is looking, you know, beyond next quarter to say what's appropriate for labor, what's appropriate for this company. How do we create the most value for the stakeholders, all the stakeholders in the company? And I would argue that even even states that say it's only the stockholders, that's wrong because great companies take care of their workers. Great companies uh, care about people, and, and the consumers also recognize that. Uh, so when you start getting prescriptive, and again, hyperbolically, the example of being prescriptive is East Germany versus West Germany. When you get really prescriptive, everybody goes down. Uh, so, so I think you need a more principles-based thing. If you start making ratios, then, for example, you know, I, I, I'm not here to, it's not, it would never be popular to defend Goldman Sachs. But if you look at the banking industry, they all received TARP money. Uh, the governments of the world, you know, saved the banking system for sure. In that aftermath, you know, Morgan Stanley, I think this year has lost a billion dollars with the f same footprint on Goldman. Um, two businesses went out of business. You know, Merrill Lynch and Lehman went out of business, basically. You know, Lehman went out of business, Bear Stearns. And what's interesting is you talk about pay and moral hazard. The people running those companies lost 99% of their money well, was in those companies. So they clearly, you know, if they were taking those kinds of risks to lose everything that they owned, that wouldn't make any sense, right? So they were taking those risks for other you know, reasons because we didn't have enough capital. Actually, we didn't have enough regulation. To, to me, uh, other reasons. So, so when you when you go down this path of saying, okay, twenty to one's the ratio. And we've got to have this. We've got to have that. You know, you, you're look, you're looking at Goldman Sachs now. They earned twenty billion dollars. You know that, that they could pay out of bonuses plus the money they made for the shareholders. And the Morgan Stanley, you know, earned a negative uh, a billion. The shareholders of Goldman Sachs are much better off, you know, than the shareholders of Morgan Stanley because their stock has has tripled. Uh, so, 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 so it's a complex set of equations. I'm not defending Goldman Sachs. I think the issue is the whole banking industry. We all bailed out the banking industry. And I think our, the administration is doing the right thing to say there should be some taxes, there should be some payback. We probably priced the bailout too cheaply, i.e., to, 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 to mm -hmm. give these banks liquidity, we should have taken more equity. By the way, the government sold the equity back to Goldman Sachs, right? And, this, and the stock has gone up to 140. It could go, you know, even higher. The government is not a, a business entity, but they should have kept that stock longer, you know, you know had them pay more th for the equity. So the whole industry had to pay it back. But when you start cookie cuttering and saying, this is 20 to one, this is 30 to one, you know, I, th I think you're going right down. Okay. Shumit, I know you wanted to jump in and then and then. I talk. get very worried, like Stephen, about uh, sort of across the board, top down, sort of, you know, uh, there's a predilection in, with difficult problems, I think it's often the case that we like to resort to relatively simple solutions. And sometimes simple solutions are good and sometimes they're not. Um, you see this in financial markets regulation right now where people will propose that, you know, um, assets should not exceed 25 times equity. And you think, well, how about 28? I like 28 more than 25. And the problem, of course, is that depending on the nature of risks that institution A takes versus B, um, the, but the point with top-down rules is that they're, they're right on average and they're wrong every time, in particular. Um, you, you really, I think, I think I'm very much with the view that judgment is really quite important here, and especially board judgment in public companies about whether value really got created or not. And I think that uh, where there might be an interesting point is whether in the sort of nuclear arms race on executive compensation, whether there's something there that, where there is a role, in fact, for a regulator or someone else to, to look at that, because um, the argument that others do it is, in fact, the most commonly cited argument for why you've got to continue to raise compensation. And sometimes something happens from outside the industry, like hedge funds, to justify why traders ought to get paid more and more and more as a share of total profits. In that situation, I think some sort of an arbiter may be an interesting idea. Well, okay, before we go to Philip, just... There's, there's too much complacency here. Look, right. go ahead. look, understand the anger out there. Understand the political pressures building out there. And we're being told it's too complex. I negotiate wages. I can give you a list of a thousand CEOs who've told me no a thousand times. Why can't people start saying no to these compensation levels that are being paid? There has to be some kind of alignment. There needs to be some kind of a benchmark. Peter Drucker was universally admired in life and in death. Explain why you're paying more than 20 to one. And look that worker in the face and say, I'm worth 350 times more than you, 
And please understand, I had more than you before lunchtime. There has to be some kind of alignment. And you can't tell me it's beyond imagination that you can't find the metrics to link reward systems with a broader social purpose. I've seen them in retailers. They have their quadrants, they have their, their graphs. What are we doing with suppliers? What are we doing with consumers? What are we, how is our workforce? What are we doing to help local communities? This can be done. The greed factor has to be taken out. Comparing one CEO with another CEO is going to leave us into the same mess. We have, the, we have a, a massive recession. 200 million people more out of work than there were before this crisis. It's taxpayers' money. It's that guy earning 350 times less that is bailing out the guys earning 350 times more. The complacency has to stop. And you have the wherewithal and the genius to make it. Something has to change. That graph which is on its way down has to come out of orbit and down to Earth. You can help create a new set of expectations. But there's not enough happening, and it's, it's, it's unforgivable, the complacency that we're seeing. Things have to change. You know, I, I, I agree with that, although I don't think it's one or the other. In other words, it's not 20 to 1 or nothing. Um, one example, which is really interesting, which happened uh, just a couple weeks ago in the U.S., is, is what the FDIC did, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, with respect to the fees that they charge banks. So they basically charge a fee to the banks so they can insure all the deposits uh, in the United States uh, at 8,000 banks. What they did is they have a three-tier uh, fee structure. Uh, tier one is if you have a – they haven't implemented this. They've just started to talk about it. Tier one is if you have a poor compensation structure pay too much, don't have the right disciplines, the board comp committee is not involved. That's a very high fee, very high fee. The middle fee is when you're sort of average. And then the third, you pay actually a very low fee if you have very responsible compensation philosophies. So I think there's things like that. I mean, I mean I'm, in some ways, I'm not a big fan of that kind of intervention. On the other hand, that actually makes some sense to me because it's less precisely prescriptive, which always gets you into trouble in ways you never predict. But it's also not just letting it go, because I completely agree. We can't. We can't let it go. Um, Peter, let me come back to you. You, you talked, um, you sort of made the comment that there's no reward, or we haven't figured out the right reward system for social investment. And I'm sorry to jump around topics, but there, you know, there's so many topics teed up here that I, I think we have to do that. Um, it's becoming easier to do that, and, and Philip was just hinting about that with the, the, the graphs and charts that people had. You know, you can, you know, emissions being the, the, the most obvious, but you can measure a lot of these externalities that just seem to be kind of airy-fairy in the past. And so, I mean, do, do, would you be willing to sort of, sort of suggest the beginnings of a new model that uh, where, you know, when it, when it comes time for determining compensation for chief executives, we take into account things other than stock prices and, 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 and profits and sales, but, but some of these externals? Sure. Yeah, I think that um, the, the way to do that, uh, I mean, there's, there's a carrot and there's a, a stick uh, to, to use um, in trying to encourage that kind of behavior. I think the carrot would be to identify the kind of social causes that you would like to further, uh, various societal uh, objectives, uh, the environment and other things, all of which we can measure. It's not easy, but we can measure. And the, the carrot would be to financially incentivize companies to uh, take that into consideration as boards mm. and specifically uh, to uh, encourage investment into those areas. So, I mean, the most obvious would be some sort of tax incentive uh, for certain levels of uh, reduced carbon emissions, as an example. But there, but there are many, many things you can do in that regard. So that would be kind of the carrot. The stick would be, um, you know, everybody's doing business with the government right now. As a customer, the government can come out and suggest what they're willing to tolerate or not. So let's just say, um, you know, one of the big aerospace companies uh, decides that they're not going to actually do business with vendors unless X, Y, Z uh, in this certain category. And they're, uh, they can do that. They're, the government may, in fact, require that, whether it's the U.S. government or the British government or any other uh, government around the world. And so that's kind of the, you know, the, 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 uh, the stick, which is you can't do business with us unless you handle yourself in a certain way. 
the, the one th so I think that's kind of the 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 sort of makings of, of, a, of a discussion on it. I think one other thing that I would say, though, is that we, you know, we're, we're I have a, a small firm, uh, and we are recruiting people from uh, graduate schools, and these folks really care about these this issue, um, and it's to, to, to compensation to some extent, but more so, what is the firm doing to be responsible, both in the environment and in society? And 20 years, when I got out of business school, a long time ago, to be honest, people just couldn't care less. They absolutely couldn't care less. Now it matters. And so I think to some extent our young people are forcing us to head in this direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mark, I'd love, to, and maybe you could talk more about Pennsylvania, for example, and, and yeah. I, yeah. I, I would add to what, what Peter said. Um, one of the things that we do is, is, uh, is employee research. And one of the maybe not so surprising findings, but consistent with what Peter's saying is, the third highest driver of employee engagement among those entering the work workforce is a company's uh, 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 kind of image and what they do with regard to social responsibility, corporate social responsibility being green and that sort of thing. So this is, this is the kind of thing where um, a company doing good is not, is not at odds with um, being you know, fiscally responsible and, and driving the, you know, the profitability and future revenues. It, it actually aligns uh, quite, quite nicely. Um, I, I do think that, uh, that the governance environment has to align and could pe perhaps further encourage these sorts of things. And coming back to Pennsylvania, you can take into account current shareholders, future shareholders, employees, the community in which you live, and you can, as I said before, prioritize them any way you like. And I think the rub is when a company does these things that are good and doesn't perform, what will investors say? Well, the other, the other problem is there's a reason that, you know, 90% of the companies are headquartered in Delaware. <laughs> so so you, you need a global approach to this in terms yeah. of, of, of having this uh, right. approach right. because people, Pennsylvania is going to have a huge unemployment rate if, if companies in, in Delaware, you know, don't follow those kinds of standards, which actually do, do maybe cost the company money. And, and what, you, what you see uh, in, in terms of those who, who oversee and rate uh, governance standards, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of them would like their, the, the corporations they follow to be headquartered in Delaware because it's only shareholder interests. And, and, and I think there is, is real space to do something broader here. But you know, back, to, back to the end, the crux of this discussion is we're talking about what is the next crisis you know, in, in, in Davos, and people have said various things in meetings I've seen today. But I think it is a crisis that this gap is so huge today in America, it's, it's, the gap is actually larger in India and China than it is in America, mm -hmm. uh, because because I know Chinese businessmen and any businessmen that are that are making huge amounts of money, and and, and the lower end makes even less than they make in America. So it could be a thousand to one in these places. And what's going to happen in America and other places if we get to a point we're going to have you know populist uprising, we're we're going to have dissent mm -hmm. because it, it it is going to be a crisis. So we've got to find a way to solve it. And again, it's got to be done over time. My simplistic view is. The government maybe needs to promote mechanisms for workers to share more in the equity value of the firm and do that over time. So right, if you said right now, whatever we've done, we've created a, a just an unsustainable disparity, and, and you say the disparity is, is uh, it, we should get it down to 20 to 1, you might have to give 50% of the equity of all the companies in America to the workers. Weird. Well, then we'd have a massive stock market drop and a dislocation, you know, you know, and, and we'd, we'd create chaos. But I think the only way to solve this over time, or at least simplistically, is is we have to start getting labor, have more equity in the companies and thinking like shareholders and, and actually put that on top of a fair wage I think and they can benefit by it yeah. and they should have upward, and we have in the United States upward mobility. You know, I, yeah. I, drove, a moving, I drove a moving van, I, it, I spent 27 years of my life as labor <laughs> and I spent 27 years of my life kind of in management Good. And, 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 and you know, I, I know what it's like, like that, to, you know, to, it's to, like, to, I think, to live that way. And as much as the focus is on what the level of CEO pay is, you have to think about how you're gonna lift the boats of everybody. And there's not enough attention being paid to this. If you look at inequality today, um, across the OECD countries, inequality is on the rise. And the gap between the rich and the poor is actually growing. And it's growing because the people at the top are kind of in a race uh, into the uh, orbit of, of, uh, of new and enormous reward systems. So the more attention has to be given to, to the people at the bottom of the pile. I mean, if you look at who these people are, it is young people. It is young adults with, with children. And it's single parents with a growing group of, um, of, uh, of pensioners. That's where 
there is a, a locus of, of, of a lack of opportunity and a lack of the means to make it. And therefore, therefore, in this discussion, we have to look at active labour market policies. And unfortunately, when you were a, 27, a leader for those 27 years, I can bet you now that the collective bargaining coverage, if you're covered by a collective agreement in the United States, then you're going to get a pretty fair standard of living. When you take away that pillar of collective bargaining and the recognition of a trade union, then you're taking the rug away, that path towards some form of, of income security and, and, uh, and economic security. That doesn't mean to say it means non-productive, because we're, the workers of the state aren't even being paid for the improvements in productivity that they've brought about. Their real income hasn't improved since 1973. That's why you see that, that flat red line there. So in the conclusions of this group and in this broader consideration, I don't think it's beyond the realms of imagination to find reward systems which, which, which uh, could be linked to your societal performance over and above the stock market, because that's what you've been doing anyway. The FTSE in the United Kingdom has dropped by 25% since the year 2000. Bonuses have gone up 350%. So you know, this has to be, this coupling has to, this has to end. And therefore, this bit, and then you talked about the global labor scene. You know, we make global agreements with companies. We've got millions of workers covered by global agreements. We talk about union recognition throughout the operation where the company is. We talk about reward structures. We talk about getting local negotiating rights and local organizing rights. And we do it in a sense of partnership and a sense of goodwill. And we make, we make improvements. There's a global commitment to decent work. We managed to get the Director General of the ILO in the G20 process. He now sits there with, with the President and the Prime Ministers for the first time. And, what, what, and what's happening is now we get the G20 Labour Ministers meeting. This is going to give us an opportunity to address that, those bottom 10% issues. And I think in the conclusions of this, uh, if I, I, I would strongly suggest that attention has to be made. You know, we could get that 20 to 1 in a better shape by lifting the 1. Yeah, and the question to me is, you know, strategically and tactically is, are you better off going in and saying we want to be 20 to 1? Or are you better off going and say, look, there's this disparity here. We've got to find ways like equity, like appropriate yeah. unionization, you know, to solve this gap. And maybe it doesn't work. Maybe it is just warfare. Look, if the boss is but we've got to have enlightened labor and enlightened management. If the, if the, the same compensation direction. committee is putting in a, an incentive scheme, why, don't every, why doesn't every worker get the same deal? That's not happening. He has a deal which is fixed. The, the, the discretionary element is getting larger and larger. It seems to have less to do with the realities on the ground. If you have an incentive scheme, open it to the entire workforce. And I agree with this point that, you know, that, that people are looking for social, you know, this social responsibility dimension. It's something that people are taking into account. So I would hope that coming from this debacle that we've seen, that we can have a new discussion about the purpose of business, about what the outcomes, to have fairness of outcomes and fairness of process. And if you put that in as a criteria, you know, are we fair in paying this guy, man or woman, 350 times more than the guy on the shop floor? They probably say, no, we're not. What are we doing? OK, I don't mind if a CEO gets a bonus because women get, get, get equal pay in the operation. Why don't you put that in as a criteria? And so on and so forth. This is not beyond the realms of imagination. We have to change the greed factor, change expectations. And there's a place, and this, this can be done. But behavior has to change. Shumi, did you, you want to you add? OK. Shumi, let me ask you, because I mean, there, there, there are a few issues that, that, that get people emotional. This is obviously one of them, uh, and it's an important issue. But the other is, is you know, this phenomenon of mediocre CEOs laughing all the way to the bank. Um, and you started to say there could be a solution that you could imagine, <coughs> perhaps a regulatory one. Can we explore that for a second w you know, with you and anybody else? You know, f finish that thought. What, what? Because you, you seem to be generally against this kind of regulation, but in this case, uh, might be open to it. So, what, what were you thinking? I, I, I think. Let me let me just pick up two examples of this sort of thing. I mean, I, I generally think that. Um, I, I want to be clear, Philip, that you understand that. I personally think this is a very serious issue, and I also think that it is uh, uh, imperative that it's dealt with as a public policy matter. Mm -hmm. I think companies, as an instrument of society, are quite poor at public policy. That's kind of what I'm saying. I'm saying that actually when I think about what can be done by a company, by a board, by a CEO, I generally think conflating public po and, and companies and CEOs that get too public policy minded get in trouble as well, you know, because they're not particularly focused on what they're doing. 
So now, let me just explain two sort of ways in which I think this might work. I think the internalization through tax and other... So social good is lower carbon. Social good is uh, better communities. These things can be incorporated into incentive systems that, that matter, and they are not today. And I think, you know, I think uh, Peter, you raised this in your comments, and I think that, that's worthwhile. But let me give you two examples of situations where I think um, uh, th th there is a real role for boards and, and, and managements to make this work. And I link both of these to situations where boards are actually different from each other in how they perform. The better ones, I think, tend to worry about the endurance of the institutions that they work for. So they're concerned about companies surviving for the long term and being successful for the long term. And if you take that view, even in real world companies, in, 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 uh, in the real economy, um, it is very clear that how you participate in civil society has an implication on the value of the business. Um, so for example, it is, it is you know, it, it would probably be a jolly good thing to get a regasification terminal in the south of Italy um, because of what Italy needs by way of energy. Uh, but to make that happen, you're not going to get there unless you deal with the concerns of citizens who live around these things. You, you're going to have to con connect with social good in order to make this work. Uh, some of the most successful foods companies around the world have finally figured out that local food supply chains are a very important part of doing good business. It's, just, it's not about being socially minded as a value in itself, but actually recognizing that there is value in social purpose. And I think that that, that is sort of the first point I'd make. Let me take another one from the financial uh, sector, which, which I think is, is uh, uh, on all of our minds. It seems to me that the big issue here, uh, and so again, I'm on this role of the role of the board in thinking about compensation. Um, I think that the problem you have uh, at, at the heart of this is, for example, traders, as a share of the profit pool, have taken out probably double what they did 25 years ago. Okay. And we talk about this as a splitting problem between talent and capital, sort of what shareholders make versus what employees make. It's very clear that there's an underpriced or unpriced role that taxpayers have played in underwriting, as, as a last resort underwriter, what these institutions do. We need to have a discussion about the share that is paid to do that sort of thing as well. So it's not just a compensation question. For the board, there is also a question about securing the company for the long term, and therefore the share that goes to compensation, goes to the return on capital, and goes to insurance of some form, perhaps capital reserves. I'm simply saying, therefore, that trying to do social policy through companies is dangerous. I think it is, that does not in any way uh, contradict the notion that it's a very important set of issues to deal with. But there are things that better boards do that can, in fact, incorporate a much clearer social purpose with a sense of the longevity of the institution within that discussion. Yeah, Mark. I mean, one of the things I, I'd add, which I think is, is consistent with that, is um, the notion of time horizon and the period over which we want to judge performance of, of executives, of boards, um, and, and companies over time, and I think uh, it needs to lengthen. Uh, now, boards can operate on that basis, but then others are also uh, charged with um, making an assessment of that performance, and that gets to shareholder groups, it gets to uh, governance uh, institutions and those sorts of things, and if those don't align with those other expectations, those other metrics, there's gonna be a disconnect. So what I'm saying is, if we set goals for an organization in a three to five year time horizon and executive pay aligns with that, yet shareholders and others are judging that CEO's performance by virtue of looking at the stock price over the next three to six months, we have a disconnect. Mm. And this is why I think simple um, apparent prescriptions uh, need to be thought through because you can have unintended consequences. So I think there needs to be alignment all the way, and this gets to governance, it gets to society and, and everything else. So I think we, we can't ask for one thing out of one side of our mouth, and then, and then when we vote, vote a different way. I think, I think that, that's a critically important point that we need to keep in you mind know, I, here. I'd also say, you know, back, which I think is the 80-20, this disparity issue. You know, you know, paying the traders versus another trader, you know, that, that's not going to solve the world's problem. That's an issue. I agree that's an issue. But the bigger issue to me is this disparity issue. And uh, having experience in looking at government, we've underinvested into education to give upward mobility to workers. Right. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, to me, it's not so much is there a 20 or 30 to 1 ratio, but if, that, if we bring the person in at 1, and within five years, you know, he's at, he's at 20 to 1 or 10 to 1, because we've had education, we, we, we move up the chain, because that's the only way the industrialized countries are going to keep up. I just don't think you're not going to walk into to Target or, or Tesco in the UK 
And if you see a flashlight for, for one pound and another one for 10 pounds, you're not going to buy the 10 pound one, I don't think, even you, if it said, you know, done by a union shop, you're not going to pay nine pounds more. It's just not going to work that way. But the way to get this spiral down, I think, is you come in at a level, we've got to invest more in training and education to, to, to lift everybody up. And we've really short shifted that, certainly in the United States, as I went around Massachusetts and I talked to government officials, uh, we were spending in Massachusetts $770 million a year on unemployment. We had 300,000 people unemployed, and we had to do that, mm -hmm. and that was appropriate. And then I thought, okay, if you have 300,000 people unemployed, and we did have a lot of job openings, med tech, uh, uh, auto mechanics, a lot of good jobs, good paying jobs, how much are we spending on training in Massachusetts? So I went to the government to figure that out, $21 million. So 300,000 people unemployed, 770 million unemployment, $20 million in training. I went around the state, I visited 10 training centers, we have great training centers, and I say, why aren't there more people in here at the, the Edison, the, the Franklin Institute, which trains people to be pharmacists and, and uh, opticians, and, and there's jobs in, in the Boston Globe available. Why don't you have more people in here? Well, they're unemployed, they can't afford the training. Mm. The training's $5,000 a year for two years. So we need governmental policies mm. to invest right. in the training. And, and what I found with government is, you know, corporations are, are accused of being short-term oriented. Almost governments become almost even more short-term oriented because <laughs> They, they want to make the quick hit. Build one bridge, you employ 100 people for a year, but where do they go after the bridge is built? And, and you know, we've built all the bridges. Mm. So, so, so unfortunately, government, it's not great to run for government to say, look, I want to spend you know, $5 billion on, on workforce training, on education, to move people up the chain, to move them from you know, a, a, a starting worker to a shop floor manager to a manager of all those folks, and get them up the chain as fast as possible, and stay ahead. And then the developing world is going to take some of those you know, lower paid jobs, and, and these people can move up. So, so I think training, uh, workforce training from the top to the bottom, from the educational system, uh, certainly in the United States, we've really short shifted that in the last 20 years. I'm very concerned about that. We need a massive Manhattan Project in education in the United States, and I think in industrialized Europe as well, to get people you know, up to the next level. And there's the coming crisis, because public expenditure, government deficits is under enormous pressure. And then you're going to have a real dilemma, because the people that bailed out the system are going to find that their schools are going to be in trouble, their hospitals are going to be in trouble, their public infrastructure is going to be in trouble. And uh, another thing that's disappointed us, I have to say, in these bailout packages is, as you mentioned, is the amount of funds that have actually, actually gone into active labor market measures has been marginal, if any at all. Banks have been saved, uh, but when it comes to taking care of working people in the broader sense, this hasn't happened, and that's why well, we did this, with the, we did this with the is auto, why. Mr. Controversy, we did yep. with the auto industry, and it's yep. still controversial, but there were, I, I, I would say the, you know, the second most money in the United States went into the auto yeah. industry to, to save it and save a lot of jobs and hopefully yeah. have them prosper again. But, yeah. but, 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 but I agree with you. It, but you can't do that forever. That's the government spending. We've got to mm. invest in education. We've got to invest in new business startups. We've got to invest so people can be employed and move up that chain. Yeah, I agree with okay, that. Okay, I, I want to open this to the audience in one second, but just sort of a quick lightning round. Um, you know, Klaus Schwab actually himself wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal recently where he talked about how it was in the context of the, the, the latest discussion about, about you know, obscene bank bonuses in the US, um, that this sort of culture of greed really has, has sort of dark, th th there's a breakdown of, of kind of communitarian values and that there's, there's kind of a, he hinted at a dark societal, well, and, and you just said it yourself, understand the anger. So in the lightning round, I, you know, I'd love to have each of you just pick one point. What is the most urgent thing that needs to be done to address, and I know we've, we've talked about a lot of issues, but this, um, you know, th 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 this issue that we've talked about could, could bubble up into anger, into unrest, uh, this sort of big unsustainable uh, gap, uh, income inequality and sense of, of yeah, the, the, the CEOs are, are out of control and don't, don't represent the interests of, of their employees, et cetera. So, so, you know, one most important thing that needs to be done, we'll do a quick round, then we'll open up to questions. Do you, want, do you want just the, the solution or any explanation? <laughs> uh, you don't need to show your work. All right. The, uh, I would say board reform. Uh, you know, board, and the only thing I would say about that is that boards are at the center. Uh, they are ultimately the accountable body for uh, a corporation. Uh, and I think there, there are lots of the things that we're talking about here. In fact, almost every one of them is, is some way linked to shortcomings in the boardroom. And so that would be my, uh, okay, my punchline. Stephen. 
Yeah, I, don't, I, I, I learned in politics there never is any one word answer, so you should kind of take control and say that was a great question and not answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll use that technique to, here today. Uh, I, I think, and, and this, this can't apply to the whole world. I think for the United States, we need more fair tax policy, and then we've got to reallocate that money into training, uh, job creation, uh, uh, funding banks that would fund startup operations uh, to make the United States competitive again. And we've gone away from that. I think, secondly, there has been a reevaluation. The, the only you know, good thing coming out of this crisis is, I think, there really has been a reevaluation. I sense it when I ran for office. I know it with people in it, to say, you know, we, we have gone too far. It, it, it's not about, uh, you know, owning the next Ferrari and 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 uh, and 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 buying the bigger car and all that. There's got to be a, a fundamental shift, and I think we're seeing some of the fundamental shift with consumer consumer behavior going down and more savings in the United States. So, so two things: governmental policy that kind of helps level the playing field and and brings folks folks up like they used to do. Uh, back in the 50s with the GI Bill, coming, people coming back from the war, those opportunities you know, have gone down under the policies we've had in the last 25 years. And number two, we need a societal recognition that it's about quality. It's, it's about quality of life. It's about a, 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 everybody you know, pulling on the same wars. It's not about you know, who can have the biggest diamond or you know, you know, car. Okay, great. Mark? Um, I, I just uh, feel compelled to make one point, and, and that is not every corporation is broken here. Not everything's broken. Uh, the, the anger out there is understandable uh, because there have been instances where it hasn't worked. But there are a lot of organizations where things are working pretty well, and I think we should look at them for, for best practices. Mm -hmm. I think those include uh, boards that are populated by very, very qualified, diligent people who take their jobs seriously, set the right goals for the organization that may include things around sustainability, it may include things that have a longer term time horizon, but set the right goals, exercise judgment in selection and management and development of executives, and hold those executives accountable. To design pay structures that align with what you're trying to achieve and hold them accountable. At the end of the day, you can't legislate integrity, you can't legislate judgment, you can't legi legislate competence. Boards need to get close to those executives and, and make sure that they're doing the right thing. And I think in the vast majority of, of, of instances, the intent is right. Um, and we ought to look at, at those places for best practices that we can um, calibrate more often. Uh, the other point I'd make is I think, it, uh, Steve mentioned the point about sound bites. I think we'll get to better practices when we lower the temperature around some of these things and, and, and look at facts and place things in context. After all, I think that's a co an individual and collective responsibility because um, what we're all trying to do, at, at the end of the day, at the highest level, is, is reach the same objective, and that is economic prosperity that, that cascades across, across society. That's at a very macro level. And raising the temperature um, to too, too high a fever pitch does not facilitate getting to, to the right answers. Okay, Philip. Uh, I see it as my job to raise the temperature, I'm sorry. Uh, and what we're seeing is, is simply unacceptable. Uh, we are far from being out of the woods with this crisis. And the levels of unemployment that we're seeing today will increase this year in the OECD countries and probably continue to increase for the next two years. Now we're going to see a recovery, maybe a profits recovery, maybe an earnings recovery. Governments tackling the deficit whilst unemployment is on the rise. So I would say tackling the unemployment issue has to be key. Secondly, um, in, the, in the, the contours of the global labor market, there are 3.2 billion workers. One billion of those are on two bucks a day. The overwhelming majority of them have no form of social protection whatsoever. No pension, no unemployment benefit and inadequate uh, housing and education and all the rest of it. So this has to be addressed. This, this, is, this is a drama. Uh, this, this, this has to be addressed. I would say on labor standards, every worker to be covered by a collective bargaining agreement where they are enabled to have a say on pay, where they have the right to organize and a right to uh, negotiate. And I'd like to see companies commit to fairness publicly in the articles of association, that they're going to be a fair company, that they're going to be fair in terms of the outcomes, fair in terms of the process, and that, and that this is going to condition how they, they're going to reward their, their CEO. And you can include pursuit of profit in that as well. Mm. Okay, Shimi. I'd, um, I'd vote for three things. I think that there are some CEOs that are worth 350 or whatever the number is, and some that are clearly not. And so I think 
some attention, concerted attention to boards and their judgment, I would actually completely support uh, over more board process or more sort of formality about you know this kind of committee or that one. I think that um, quite narrowly in the context of public policy, there does need to be a debate about this. I think I'd point out that even within the OECD, there are very big differences in the social consensus and where it's landed in terms of that top to bottom ratio. And that has to do with social policy and how it's constructed. Within that context, I'd vote heavily for skills as a, as a big driver of the improvements of, of the bottom half. Um, and third, I'm, I'm personally a, a big believer in the notion of widespread participation and equity. And so finding a way to align the incentives of everybody top to bottom, which is one of the fundamental problems with public markets governance, is, uh, is an excellent idea. So I'd, I'd be very much in favor of much broader participation top to bottom in the same set of things, um, i.e. value. Okay, great. Let's, uh, let's open up to the floor. Uh, yes, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, wait for the microphone. Yeah, everyone do please. Uh, I'm Konstantin Mettenheimer, chairman of Freshfields Brookhouse, the law firm. I came here for two subjects I thought would be behind it. One is public perception, public anger, how to deal with that. We've had a fair share of that, if not more. What I haven't heard about is the compensation. Can it help in avoiding the next crisis? How do we make sure that the rewards don't end up with management and the risks with the company or the government. And quite frankly, on that one, the temperature has been so high, the temperature has been so high, that personally, I haven't heard enough about that. And I would really appreciate if we could spend the next 20 minutes trying to talk about how do we improve compensation models, not to deal with public perception, we've had that, but to avoid the next crisis, and a better distribution of risk and reward. Thank you. Okay, uh, l l let's deal with that. Do does the compensation system encourage risky behavior? Did it get us into the crisis? What do we do about that? Who wants to? I think the answer is yes. I mean, there's no doubt that the, that the remuneration policies that we saw in the pursuit of uh, profit at all costs by CEOs that didn't understand the products that they were selling. We know this. We represent bank employees. We know the pressures that they were under to sell any kind of profit with a, with a full realization that the products being sold were not going to be to the benefit of the consumer. So we're starting from there, that when you look at the incentives given to people within the organization, it has to have this, a broader understanding that is this going to do harm to the consumer or not. We have managed to convince at the G20 level, the Financial Stability Board, where we, are, we can't get in there, we can talk to them in a certain sense, but not in an institutional sense, that they are now looking into, into this uh, issue of compensation schemes in the financial services side. If you're in receipt of government funds, then I think Obama got it right, then you pay the, then, then the limit is 500,000 bucks. You can have a good life for 500,000 bucks in the United States, I would have thought. So I think then you can, there's other areas you can look at in terms of liquidity and capital controls and, and, and all the rest of it. There are these kinds of measures which people are working on, which I, which I expect to see bear fruit. I would say a few things in response to that. One is, I think, um, when we see evidence of this, compensation committees and others have to do more scenario planning around what, what the unintended consequences might be of particular compensation structures, and that's, that's happening. That would be one. The second would be, and I just came from a session on risk in the boardroom, uh, boards and management for that matter have to really understand the risks that the enterprise is undertaking. And I think that um, uh, maybe was not as completely understood, maybe that's stating the obvious, as it should have been. Um, and, and that, to me, is, is amongst the top one or two responsibilities of a board, is to understand that the, the risks that an institution is undertaking and, and take, uh, take smart risks, take steps to mitigate those risks, et cetera, and clearly the, the kind of pro-cyclicality of some of these risks, the, the, the fact that they were not independent and converged the way they did was clearly missed. The third point, which I think is an important one, is to distinguish between um, kind of mistakes versus bad intentions, okay? And clearly bad intentions, we, we don't want to see any of that. Um, but well-meaning, capable people do make mistakes. Uh, we, we need to learn from them and move forward in a positive way. Um, there's a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking, to use a U.S. term, that's going on here. 
And uh, those that, that want to render judgment should look uh, prospectively at the kinds of practices, goals that are set for organizations, and opine in advance, if they can, as to what might ensue here in uh, an environment that they might not have anticipated ahead of time. It's relatively easier after the fact. Uh, so I, I would distinguish between bad intentions and just mistakes that, that were made in, in, in assessing uh, how to respond to things. Okay, uh, Shumit. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer your somewhat narrow question narrowly, which is I think that um, in much of the developments after the crisis and thinking about solutions to this thing, I, I do think that you need a worldview on why all of this happened. I, I do think that uh, Tim Geithner did get it more or less right in September, October, when he said that, look, I mean, there are these institutions out there. We don't want them to fail, so we back them up. When you back them up, you create the problem of moral hazard. And so if you do create the problem of moral hazard, I think you've got to really think about solutions that create mechanisms that try and mitigate the moral hazard. And I have no doubt at all that compensation design, stru the structure, of, and that's the narrow issue you raised, that the structure of how compensation is done and, and where, where you sort of apply the locus of that analysis has a very big implication in securing the system for the future. I'm happy to get into that in more detail in some other one, but I don't think it's the subject of this panel, so. Okay, uh, yeah, quick follow up and then we'll take yeah, that question. Uh, you know, I, th I think on that specific question, it's, it's all about shifting things from short term performance-based compensation to longer-term based compensation. That's the, the symbol of it. You know, stepping back, many of those firms that went bankrupt had a lot of, had done a lot of that shift and still went bankrupt and lost all their money. So, so it, again, it's not simple. Beyond shifting into longer-term systems, you have to have regulations that enforce capital adequacy throughout the financial system. And that's kind of the 80-20 of it. I think the compensation system have to be fixed and they should be, for all companies, be longer term oriented, more stock oriented. And I throw on the fact that we've got to e evolve so that labor does participate either in a profit pool if you exceed, uh, exceed certain goals or equity, you know, to, to kind of get that ratio collapse on a performance basis, just like management. If you do all three of those things, you know, that'll mitigate some of these things. But, but the number one thing, two thing and three thing is capital adequacy throughout the system. That's where it broke down, capital adequacy and, and liquidity. Um, and and uh, and they got to fix that, and they have they haven't yet, which is, which is concerning. Okay, there's a question here. Uh, w wait for the mic, and please identify yourself. Uh, third row, fourth row. My name is Cezwe Masana from First Rand in South Africa. Uh, just a, a comment and then a question. Um, in South Africa, we've come up with, I uh, think, what is a close alignment between public pol policy and uh, the objectives of company in generating profits. And it's found itself in, by participation, you know, from community, labor, and so on, uh, with the, a structure which is called the codes of good practice, which includes the need for companies to realize that they exist not just to, to make profit and pay taxes, but also to invest in social goods such as education, skills development, enterprise development, and so on. Uh, so maybe there, there may be some lessons there. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, one area which we haven't been able to quite solve, and I'd, I'd be interested in um, some answers here, especially since alignment is a big issue, is around how we make sure that uh, we can have executives and employees have skin in the game. I think it's a point that uh, Mr. Weinberg and uh, Mr. You know, Paglucia actually mentioned, without applying too much leverage. In other words, because you know, stock options, as we know, uh, do not have the downside that the shareholders, for instance, would, would suffer if things went wrong. You know, executives can only end probably zero bonuses, but if shareholders lose money, you know, maybe executives can only be fired. That's about it. So if you want to have proper alignment in skin in the game, you've got to have people invest in the companies. But for them to do so, if you don't have limited partners or other people who can inject money, you, you've then got to apply leverage, which has its own issues. How do you solve that problem? Well, I think there could be some governmental policies that, you know, help solve that problem. If you had employees invest in a tax-advantaged way, a very tax-advantaged way, so, so you know, the projections would be a good high return on the money, and that, and that would get employees uh, without leverage. You know, it's, it's almost kind of applying to a tax to then, and then doing a social good with that tax rather than a direct tax. And I think, I think that would be an interesting scenario to do. And, I, and I've looked at business. I'm, I'm very, I'm very I shied away from investing in businesses where, 
you know, the union or labor would put in a lot of money because, because if they lose all their money, I couldn't sleep at night. So, so, so I don't like systems where, you know, the employees borrow money to put money into the company. I like systems that would, would either uh, give them a wage or give them a government tax or give the company a tax incentive to make programs available for them to invest something, you know, along with something the company would invest so they would all profit as, as the company grows. Okay, we've got time for one more quick question right here. Thanks. Chris, uh, Chris Giles from the Financial Times. I apologize to the questioner two, two ago, so I'm going to go back to the level issue. The, I think no one has actually addressed the issue of why it is that the executive compensation has gone up from 40 times uh, the poorest uh, employee to 300 times. And as far as I can see, there are four possible reasons, and I wanted to ask the panel which of the four they are. The first is that executives 20 years ago were monstrously underpaid. The second is they have improved companies sixfold. So even though economic performance hasn't got much better, companies are far better. The third is being an executive is such a bloody awful job now, and it wasn't before, that you really need six times more money uh, to pay. Or the fourth is they've exploited market power somehow, and they don't really deserve the money. Which do the panel think it is? <laughs> Dive in. I think the uh, I think the appropriate answer to that question must be four, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I would strongly endorse that number four. It seems it's number four. Well, I think uh, there's there's something to do with the power of ideas. I think that there's um, there's been very important work done around the value of options and incentivizing uh, uh, how how executives operate and work, which dates back to about that time and. It's been extremely influential from, from, from when you consider its impact on on, on compensation structures. And, and Mark, you, you know this well, better than that, I do. That, that's, that's why I was hesitating. I, I think um, you, that's why we need to be careful of unintended consequences in, in a lot of ways. I think we need to make sure we treat underlying causes as opposed to symptoms. Um, back in 1993, I think it was in the US, uh, a limit was imposed on the amount of base salary that companies could get a tax deduction for. And that was a million dollars, and it was meant to limit pay. And that probably did as much to spawn equity-based compensation as anything else, where investors were saying, I want the executives paid to align with the market value of the company, because after all, right. that's how my investment grows. Um, now, how much of that you know, contributed to this, I don't know, but, but one could make an argument in that, in that regard. Yeah, I, I would just say that, the, of course, the answer is four, uh, by the way you asked the question. But I, I actually would turn it back and ask our, our gentleman from California, uh, and, and here's a question for you, because I think in some ways it, it gets to the heart of this, which is that if there's a company uh, that creates twice as much value of its next best in its industry, and let's say the, the CEO, people believe, is responsible for generation of a billion dollars of market cap. Say Apple, something like Apple. Okay, take Apple. How do you, how do you as an investor feel about C that CEO's compensation? All right, we have 10 seconds for the answer. Well, I think we still would have concerns about, about why the board still feels that's necessary to spend resources in that manner. Of course, we enjoy the value that's created by that, by that extraordinary performance, but um, could that be created to minus X percent of the amount? I, I don't think that that would be less than concerned about the board's responsibility to do a measurement around that, not as much as just that free reign. Okay, uh, we're out of time. Um, you know, we, we sort of kept it going in lieu of summing up. It was a great panel, great audience. We could have gone on for a lot longer. Um, thanks, everybody, and uh, have a good day. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks a lot.